Hello again. Um, I actually wanted to ask another favor. Can we get a couple microphones out in the audience? Um, I really want to know what you guys are expecting from this conversation. Uh, any questions that you might have about venture capital? Uh, Could you a bit further away? A little farther away. Is yeah. that working? So what questions you might have about venture capital? Um, I want to know why you guys are here. What's going on in, in, in your minds? Because I, I really like, sure, I, I want to interact with you guys. I want to hear your ideas. I want to know how I can tailor my talk. This is not all canned. I can throw this out if you want me to and talk about something totally different. Um, but I want to hear from you in terms of what's interesting to you. So let's get some feedback from the audience. Let's throw out some com comments or questions. Venture capital, why you're here. So yesterday we heard that uh, in Europe, uh, what should you expect uh, to sell your company for is much lower than in the US. Mm. Is it uh, because in Europe other companies buy companies and in in US you do IPOs or what's the reason? Okay, okay. So you're interested in, in valuations of companies at exit? Uh, and exit opportunities uh, compared to the US. That's a topic that you want to try to talk about. Okay, I don't know if I can talk about Europe specifically. Um, I can talk about some of the US exits that are going on in terms of the IPO market that, are, that seems to be opening up a little bit. Um, but I, I think that's, that's a topic we'll, we'll try to cover. So let's get some, some other folks. A US venture capitalist just afraid to invest in Europe companies in small startups. And my question is, uh, uh, what should European companies do, maybe which levels they have to rise, that they should be interested for US VC? Okay, okay. So what should a European startup do to be interesting to a US VC? Okay, cool. What else? Let's go to the back. Why are you guys here? Hi. Um, Basically, for our startup to work, we have to get the United States. Well, mm -hmm. that's a given. Mm -hmm. uh, given the audience that we're looking at, the market that we're looking at, uh, the question is, what is the best and fastest way? Incubators, accelerators, venture okay. capital, how do we do that? Okay. Okay, so how, how best to get to the U.S.? Okay. And maybe one more, and then I can start in on some comments. Yeah. Down right in front. Hello. Can I ask a question then? Here. Oh, okay. two more. Uh, so if I correctly understood, you also invest in Latin America. Yeah. So can you talk about the differences of venture capital in Latin America sure. and the US? And sure. What's the big difference? How okay. do you look differently okay. into companies? Okay. Yeah. Hello. I wanted to ask uh, how long does it take and how many documents do you need to check out to make a decision to give or to decline? Uh, I'm sorry, one more time for that. Uh, if a startup gives, um, enters your venture capital fund mm -hmm. to like uh, get a communication, so how much documents do we have to give to present their idea and uh, what actions do we need to take to like, for you to decide to accept or to decline the, the project? Okay. How long does it take? Okay, sounds good. Um, so before I start in on the mindset, I'm gonna tie this in together in a second. Um, there's been some questions basically about how do you get the attention of US venture capital? Um, that's a common theme and what does it take to actually get in front of someone and, and actually get a deal done? Um, so one of the things that I would recommend for any startup that's based here, um, it's difficult to get US dollars to say, you know what, come to the Silicon Valley, we'll take a look at you, and we'll write you a check, and then you can go home and go do whatever you want to do. The reason why, right? So one of the things that good venture capital in an ideal world does is that it adds additional value. It's not just about the money, right? So you want to find a venture capitalist who actually has expertise in the field that you're going into that has market knowledge about the market that you're actually going to be addressing, right? And the, the ideal situation is that you've got someone on your board who is your advocate, who is going to pick up the phone and say, here are 10 corporate customers that we're going to put you in front of. Here are 10 people that you should think about hiring. 
And more often than not, that network exists in their home market. So that's going to exist in Palo Alto, in the Bay Area, uh, on the East Coast, et cetera. So as a startup from Europe coming in and saying, hey, look, I'm going to address this market, that's awesome. But there's not a lot of help that we can give you that's going to be that useful because we want to make sure that the money that goes into the company, it's not just money. We want to accelerate that. We want to make sure that you're going to be successful. We are your advocates. The good VCs are the ones that are your advocates. They're not people who you should think of as your adversaries. And if you start to feel like you're having this adversarial relationship with someone that you're pitching, you might want to question that relationship because that's how it's going to be moving forward, right? So you have as much choice as a VC does when it comes to choosing. So it's a two-way interview. It's a two-way conversation. And you should be seeing how that person makes you feel. Do they listen? Do you feel like they're going to be an advocate? They're going to be a good partner for you? as you're in the foxhole, because startups are hard. It's a really difficult thing to tackle, and you want someone that's going to be your advocate. So um, as a European company, I think it's difficult unless you're going to be addressing the U.S. market or spending time in the U.S. Um, there's some questions about the difference between Latin America and the U.S. market, and I think you may be able to generalize this to other developing markets or other markets that are non, um, not quite as big as the U.S. when it comes to venture capital. One of the things that uh, we noticed when we started our firm in Latin America was that there were a lot of people that had money. There were a lot of people that had money. The money came from traditional industries. So the industries like forestry, from uh, farming, from aquaculture, all that money existed. And people were trying to help startups. But here's the thing, is that they would say, okay, come in, give a pitch, and we'll give you a check. Now, what we're going to require for that check is 90% of your company. So how motivated are you going to be as an entrepreneur giving up that kind of chunk of your company, right? Um, so the, it's not an issue of those people being bad. It's just they didn't really know how to actually work with founders because you have to have incentives that are well aligned. So one of the things that we did when we came into the marketplace, and my partners are Chilean, and we have... Uh, money from Chilean family offices. So we have investors too. So venture capitalists are just like you guys. So we've gone out and pitched other people that have money. So college uh, endowments, retirement funds, high net worth individuals and said, we're going to give you a return uh, on your money. And one of the ways that we do that is that we work with startups and we mentor and we help to shape the company and the future of the company. But we're not so involved that we're trying to run everything. And that was another thing that we noticed is that there's a lot of investors that wanted to get in every day and balance checkbooks. They wanted to go in your banking account, really be part of everything that you're doing on a daily basis. And that's not a good investor either because they're getting too involved in the day to day because they should be investing in you as a startup founder, as a leader of the organization. Um, so that was another contrast that, that we saw between the US uh, and uh, the, the Latin American market. And then just generally the process of um, going through and, and getting a decision done. Uh, to the question here in the front, um, there was just a lot of due diligence that we're noticing that took a lot of time that didn't really make a whole lot of sense, especially for an early company. People were asking for you know, financial projections for five, 10 years out for a company that really didn't even have customers yet, right? Um, so they were thinking like bankers. They were thinking about almost giving a loan versus thinking about... Um, uh, a startup and being able to essentially say, look, there's four things, and here we can, we can sort of go into uh, what we look for, right? So I talked about this earlier. So the market risk, technical risk, financial risk, and team risk. So if you can help satisfy those criteria, that's going to get you pretty close to uh, term sheet uh, quality. Now, a term sheet, there's a lot of different things. I have a different presentation that I, I should actually talk about is what is a term sheet? Does it, who knows what a term sheet is? Okay. Uh, who's negotiated a term sheet? These guys? Okay. Um, and what was that experience like for you guys? Long and ugly. Yeah. Any other experiences for term sheets? Yeah, there's a lot of, there's a lot of um, language that's put into a term sheet. 
um, that's basically about the control of the company and what are the conditions, what are the terms that this money is going to come into the company with. Um, and investors have a lot of different ways that they change certain terms called liquidation preferences, participation rights. These are all technical terms that I won't get into today. Um, but you're going to want to read a couple of books, one of which is Be Smarter Than Your VC and Your Lawyer by Brad Feld. Um, I think this book has been mentioned before. That's a great start in understanding how term sheets work and understanding what the process is going to be like in terms of the paperwork that's involved. Um, but I think the best thing to do is talk to mentors. I'm more than happy to give you feedback on that process. So um, that's basically what I wanted to address up front. And I'll go into then the fourth risk. And this is what I wanted to talk about today. The fourth risk and the biggest problem in startups Biggest problems in business come from one key thing. What is that one thing? What do you guys think? Someone yell it out. Team, people. That is it. So you could have a remarkable market. You could have an amazing product. But at the end of the day, when you're sitting there and watching a company, from the board, you realize that it's the people problems that really are going to make or break that company. So the team risk for what we look at is probably one of the most important criteria that we'll use in figuring out who we want to invest in. So I have a list of things that we've found from a mindset perspective that make a difference. So I've seen thousands of pitches, thousands of founders, uh, from a bunch of different markets. And there's certain things that we've been noticing that makes a difference for those founders that are successful versus those founders that are less successful. So I have about maybe 10 or 12 of them that we've been sort of toying around. And I wanted to talk about six today with you. And I want to say number one is that this is not a universal list. This is not the end all be all of how things should be. I don't own the truth. So I want to hear your feedback on whether these make sense, uh, or if there's things that you think should be added to the list, or what your experience has been, uh, especially when it comes to managing people. So Peter talked about this yesterday. So I'll talk about the growth mindset because it is so critically important. What I was saying earlier about feedback, right? We want to make sure that we're with a founder who can, who can actually listen to feedback but is not going to be completely guided by the last thing that that individual heard from a judge or from a mentor, or perhaps from another investor. Uh, so a growth-based mindset is probably one of the most important things that we've noticed for a successful founder. So there was a professor at Stanford named Carol Dweck, and she noticed uh, that there were some students at uh, university that did really well, and other students that didn't do well at all. And she started to ask herself, why is this the case? Why is it that some students did so well? So she started to do research, wanted to talk to people, went in and, and interviewed students, and essentially found that there's two different kinds of mindsets, right? Uh, and I'm not going to review all the things that Peter talked about yesterday, uh, but I think the most interesting thing from the research is that people with fixed mindsets Fixed mindsets essentially said that what you're born with is what you get in life, OK? So a fixed mindset says it's the lottery. The minute that you're born, you either win it or you lose it. And you have a fixed amount of talent throughout your entire life. And that also includes IQ. So people believe that IQ scores are completely fixed at birth, and there's nothing you can do about it, versus growth-based mindset will say, you know what? Everything that you do, everything that you get in your life is a result of the effort that you put in. It's a result of hard work. It's a result of studying. It's a result of a feedback loop. So if there's one thing that um, I would love for you guys to do, uh, we talked about this yesterday, you know, fixed mindset, they tend to give up much more easily. You don't take challenges. Uh, because ultimately, if you're so focused about being smart, Right? So imagine somebody who's been the smartest person in the room for their entire lives. School is really easy. And then suddenly they're going to be in a startup, and not everything is easy. You're going to eventually hit a point, and they talked about the plateau yesterday, where something is not going to be easy to figure out. 
what does that do to your identity if you consider yourself to be a genius? If you can't figure it out, that must mean there's something wrong with me. Maybe I'm not a genius, right? And if my entire identity is based on that, I'm going to step, step away from that challenge. Versus if I have an identity that's based on doing hard work, and it doesn't really matter if it's a challenge or not, because that means that I'm going to keep working at it, I'm going to get feedback, I'm going to master my challenges. It's much, much easier for that individual to take on challenges and to go after obstacles. Um, and an interesting factoid is, is that um, the success of others, if you have a fixed mindset, you tend to really dislike the success of others because, you know, it's a, it's a fixed pie uh, versus a growth mindset, you celebra celebrate the success of others. So um, this is all changeable. If you have a fixed mindset, you can change to a growth mindset. And I would encourage you to Google these terms. Malleable intelligence. Malleable intelligence. Changeable IQ. If you're on Google right now, go look up changeable IQ and see the research that's out there. Is that effort, complexity, stimulation can actually change your brain. And just knowing that one little fact has been enough to change people from a fixed mindset into a growth mindset. So single loop versus double loop thinking. Um, Anyone know who this guy is? Who? Chef? Yep. Who? So David Chang. Yeah, he's David Chang from New York. So I'm going to tell you a story about David Chang. So he's now a really renowned author, very successful with multiple restaurants in New York City. And um, the thing is, is that it hasn't always been the case. That's not always been how his business was. So when he first started out as an entrepreneur, he actually had problems. He was sitting in his first restaurant and no one showed up. There were no customers. So he did what everyone else would probably do. He started to do something called single loop thinking. So he started to say, you know what? There's a problem. What's the most immediate solution that I can find to this problem? So it's a linear relationship problem solution. So think about single loop thinking as almost like a um, thermostat for an air conditioning system, right? So if it's set at 70, temperature drops down, you turn it on, right? So those are the things that are very, very linear. So he thought about these things. He said, you know what, maybe I can change prices, maybe I should advertise more, maybe it's my staff, maybe I should you know, do uh, the basic things, and nothing really seemed to work. So what he did next was the thing that was really remarkable. And he used a principle from organizational development that was discovered in the late, late 70s. He did something called double loop thinking. So double loop thinking is essentially a time when you start to question your own beliefs. You question why you're doing certain things. What are the assumptions that you're making about your business? What are the assumptions that you have about the problem that you have? Is it really a problem? Or can you flip it on its head? He started asking some fundamental questions about, does a noodle bar even make sense in New York City? And he had this great conversation uh, with his team. There's this game that chefs play. It's a game that says, what is your last meal if you were to die tomorrow? Right? So they all sit around and talk about, what would I cook for myself as that last meal? And they started to think about, well, what if we actually started to do that for ourselves and then for our customers? So instead of trying to redesign the menu thinking about what the customer wanted, they actually started thinking about what they wanted. And afterwards, the business immediately took off. So the technical way of, I'm not going to read through all this, and there's research that backs this up, um, is that single loop thinking lets your existing thinking process stay in place, and double loop thinking shakes that all up, challenges your assumptions, and changes the way that you do business. So um, I would encourage you as you think about the challenge that you have in your businesses, is to step away from the immediate solutions. Step away from the things that immediately come to mind as like, yeah, let's just fix it that way. Because that may not be the best solution. And you might want to give it some time. You might want to ask, how else might I solve this? What else can I do to tackle this challenge? So Walt Disney. Everyone knows this gentleman. So when he would design a new project at um, Disneyland or uh, Disney World, or it would think about sort of um, films. 
the people that worked with Walt Disney said that there were three Walt Disneys that they knew. So the first Walt Disney was a guy that would sit and he would dream. He would actually sit down and say, here's all the possibilities that are out there. So he would paint a picture of what the world might be like with the film, with the project. After he had a good vision of what he wanted to do, he would then, his body language would change. His posture would change. And then he would actually start to say, well, how do we make this into reality? How do we actually operationalize this? It's a great idea, but how is this going to work? And then he'd actually figure out the operational piece to it. And then the final piece is that he became his own worst critic. He became a critic and his face would change. His eyebrows would furrow. And he started asking himself questions like, well, what if this didn't work? How do we know this is really going to be true? What are the problems that we're going to face with this project? So in translating that for founders, you have a dreamer, realist, and critic. So one of the things that I, I, I often see is that CEOs are great dreamers. The founder CEO. Dreamer? Yeah? Question? Do you have a question? Or are, you, are you calling yourself a dreamer? Dreamer, all right. So CEOs are fantastic dreamers, right? And the language of the dreamer is pictures. And it's about what's possible. Then there's the realist on the team, who's oftentimes the operations person, who speaks in diagrams and talks about how do we actually make this happen. And the CFO, the finance person, is the critic, who's thinking in terms of math. That's the language that the critic uses. The biggest disconnect that I have seen between people who are pitching VCs and trying to get VCs to understand their business, right? And between what the VC is asking for is between the critic and the dreamer. So <clears throat> this guy right here is talking about his vision. So I'll come in and ask a question about, well, how many users do you have? What is the specific problem that you're solving? How big is your marketplace? How long has it taken you to do X, Y, Z? What is the toughest technology that you built? And the answer that I get back comes back to the top. Well, it could be this great market. It might be this. Imagine the possibilities. And the longer that the founder talks as a dreamer, and the more that the VC is asking the question from a critic perspective, that gap gets bigger and bigger and bigger. That's your credibility gap. That's the credibility gap between the VC and the founder. And if you don't know the answer, right, a lot of times these are tough questions. They're quantitative questions. You may not have them yet. The best way to build credibility is, what do you guys think? How do you build credibility right then? And what do you do to minimize that? How do you, how do you bring those two together? Yeah. Talk less, absolutely. And? Could you say that louder, please? Say that you don't know. Say that you don't know. I don't know. Magic, magic words, first part of it. The second part of that sentence is, but I will find out, or here's our plan to find out, okay? It can be uncomfortable to say, I don't know. It can really suck to say, I don't know, because they just ask a question that was, it's so obvious, but you just didn't think of it, right? And then you're like, oh, let me try to figure out something. Let me make something up. Don't do that. Say you don't know, because it's going to drive credibility for you much more than you trying to share more about what the dream is about the company. We understand the dream. That's never the problem, rarely the problem. The problem comes down to the math and understanding where the business is going to go. So um, another thing that I've seen in early stage startups is um, totally understandable. You're out of school. Maybe it's one of the first things that you're doing. Maybe you're still in school. Founders start to think about their companies as if it were a research project as if it were a term paper for a class. And you're looking for guidance, and you want a grade, you want to be told exactly what to do. That's one of the dangerous, dangers of being an early stage startup. Um, research is awesome. We want to make sure that you understand your market. Research is great. But there's a fine line when you move from founder doing research to just researcher. And if you find yourself continually looping and going deeper and trying to figure out things, that's a sign that you've moved past the threshold. There's a great study that was done by IMD Business School 
um, and I can share all this stuff with you guys later on, that took corporate managers and entrepreneurs and put them in a situation where there was great ambiguity. They didn't know the answer to the situation. And they watched to see how people reacted, and they tracked their conversations. And two things I think were really critical. Number one uh, is that entrepreneurs took what they had and created something. Regardless of how limited it was, they were willing to say, look, what do we know? Who do I know? What can I take with what's immediately in front of me and create something now? And the second thing is that founders said, you know what? You can't predict the future. It can be tempting to want to say, look, this is exactly in 2015 in March. That's when I should launch my product. So I'm going to try to get there on that exact date. Founders, entrepreneurs actually said, you know what? It's not up to me to predict the future. It's not up to me to do that. It's actually to create the future. They have a very clear sense that what they do can actually shape what happens in the future with technology. So as you think about what you're doing in your own businesses, think about, you know what? How would you actually change some of the challenges that you're finding? What would you do about shifting that marketplace to your advantage? Because there's a lot of things that are under your control, or a lot of things that you can influence with your startup that you may not necessarily realize. So um, implications, take action. Move forward. Keep moving. If in doubt, take a step. Go do something different. Try something, but don't get caught in the over-analysis loop. Um, you know, let's play, let's play the uh, Geek Camp video. Can we play the first video? Yeah. Um, one of the things that I didn't talk about early on is, is something called Geek Camp. And it's an early stage acceleration program that our venture firm sponsors. And let's talk about it. Is there sound? There may be sound. So this is a, a quick highlight of how this goes down in Santiago, Chile. We partnered with the top university in the country. Uh, and we've actually, this last week, I was there and we selected from over 1,000 applicants for 10 positions to get into Geek Camp. And it's very much... I think Geek Camp is a remarkable opportunity for entrepreneurs to engage with some of the most interesting mentors and thinkers from the Silicon Valley who come here twice a year to help select some of the best entrepreneurs from Latin America to eventually go to the Silicon Valley and become really successful. It's an amazing bridge between Silicon Valley, the mecca of entrepreneurship of the world, where 37 to 40% of the investment in technology is being held from the United States. So our startups can go there thanks to our program, thanks to these amazing mentors we're bringing into the country to select the best startup. Everyone is so enthusiastic, and we've even said that it feels like there's an energy in the air. It, it, everyone is just so friendly and so positive, and they want to help out, and they want to learn more, and everyone wants to be in this very, very collaborative environment. We supported 76 startups so far in two years. We already raised more than $7 million for our startup. We know who's not, we have not. We know who to talk, and we have an amazing program to help you out. I was never able to go somewhere and say, I have this idea. Um, here are mentors sitting in front of me who are challenging me only because they want me to be better, because they want me to succeed. And it, it actually has surprised me so much being here that Chile as a culture and as a government really supports innovation and entrepreneurship. I mean, it's... Um, I live in San Francisco, I grew up in Palo Alto, and uh, having opportunities like this, uh, meeting the kind of people that they've been able to meet with is just is so great. It's such a blessing. To find a really interesting problem to solve, find something to make the world amazing. Find something that's going to make your team say, wow, the world is going to be awesome as a result of what we're doing here every day. And I think if you can find something like that and not just, you know, a little business or uh, you see an opportunity in an industry because, you know, you know somebody in it and you think you can make money. Go and really think about how can you change the world for the better and how can 100 million people use your product, use your service, use your site, use your app 
to do something that makes them either a little happier, makes their days a little better, makes it easier for them to get to work, anything like that. Find that impact and I think you'll do really well. So that's all. Welcome to Geekcam number four. Looking forward to see you number so five. In the um, thousands of people that have gone through to apply for this program, we've had a chance to see entrepreneurs in action. Um, and I kind of bring back to this idea of innocence at work. Um, what this means is probably one of the tougher things to, to try to tackle. Um, there's a researcher in Guatemala named Fred Kaufman who's written some articles about the idea of innocence is powerlessness, especially when it comes to work. So effective founders have this kind of perspective about their outcomes in life. So we tell everyone who's in Geek Camp, there are no victims at Geek Camp. There are no victims of Geek Camp. It's a co-created experience. And some people go through the program and don't get in, right? Uh, and there's oftentimes different reactions. The reactions can be, well, you guys didn't tell me what I needed to do. I had problems with my team. I had problems with XYZ. I couldn't make it there on time, etc. right? And there's other founders who say, well, help me learn. Help me learn. Tell me what I need to do differently. Tell me what I need to do to take action and keeping control within what I can do something about. So this idea of, of innocence starts really early for human beings. As kids, you get asked, so who drew on the wall? Who took the cookie? Who blew up the cat, right? And then the immediate reaction is, well, it's not me. It wasn't me. I, I didn't really have anything to do with it. It was, it was somebody else. So that it wasn't me it was very useful when we were really young. As a business leader, it becomes less useful. So an example that Dr. Kaufman uses, and this is completely from him, this is not my thing, I'm, I'm borrowing from him, is this notion of this apple, all right? So I'm gonna ask you a question. So we're gonna do something with the apple, and we're gonna let it fall, all right? Do it a couple times. So why does the apple fall? Gravity, perfect because I let it go. What else? Gravity, let it go. Huh? Because of height, okay, cool. So the innocent answer is gravity. The innocent answer says, totally out of my control, it just happens, right? The less innocent answer is because I let it go. The other parts of the answer is because I raise it up, because I brought it here with me, because I put it in front of you, right? So there's a lot of things that I'm doing to create this outcome. As an entrepreneur, you're gonna run into a lot of challenges. We've talked about this already. And if you're going to be in a place of leadership, you've gotta find a way to be accountable for your own results. So um, Kate had a great uh, example. We were talking on Friday night. So she runs a team of creatives. And she was saying that it's really tough to work with creatives. And at nine in the morning, creatives don't really have great answers to questions. They're late, they don't really talk to clients very well, and then in the afternoon they forget what they said in the morning, right? So she came up with a really interesting idea, and she calls it core time. Core time. Between 10.30 and 2.30 or 3 o'clock? 2.30, 10.30, 2.30. That short period of time, all creatives have got to be there on willing to answer questions for clients. Anything outside of that, totally workable. You can do whatever you want to do, essentially. So that's a reaction that's not innocent, right? The innocent reaction would have been, oh, I can't deal with creatives. Creatives are so late. I can't get any good help. I can't do this. They should be here at nine, and they're not. It's totally out of my control. She chose a path that allowed a degree of control for her outcomes. So remember that specific example as you think about any challenges that you're trying to deal with. And um, it's a force multiplier. It allows you to be more powerful as an organization with that kind of thinking and that kind of culture. So I will end with one last thing. We'll go to Sand Hill Road. Sand Hill Road is the famous place in the Silicon Valley that has all the venture capitalists. 
This is my favorite exit off the 280. And there's a gentleman there by the name of John Doerr. And uh, Mr. Doerr is one of the more famous venture capitalists, invests in a lot of interesting deals with a firm called Kleiner Perkins. And he talks about this idea of missionary versus mercenary. Uh, and it's about why you're doing what you're doing. So let's play the video, and we'll conclude with some comments. Aileen and I and the Kleiner partners were here uh, because we have a, a, a deep awe, genuine awe for the power of entrepreneurs. A couple of my partners have been entrepreneurs and I've, I've tried to start one or two companies in my own career, but entrepreneurs are clearly, uh, clearly to be revered. They're the provocateurs, they're the risk takers. Uh, they are those in our society, women and men, who focus on really getting great, big, rapid, scalable change. And by definition, an entrepreneur does more than anyone thinks possible with less than anyone thinks possible in whatever field they're working in. And importantly, at least for my values and those of my partners, uh, entrepreneurs are not mercenaries. They're missionaries. Have you read uh, Randy Commissar's book, The Monk in the Riddle? I know he's been a guest from time to time. Anybody read that book? He talks about Len Lenny and funerals.com. And one of the first concepts that is introduced by Randy is the difference between drive and paranoia, which would be a characteristic of a mercenary, and passion, which is the characteristic of the missionary. More differences between the mercenaries and the missionaries well, the mercenaries are opportunistic, always interested in the pitch and the deal, and they're kind of sprinting for the short run, as opposed to the missionaries, who are much more strategic. They're focused on the really big idea and forming a partnership that will last. And they know that this business of innovating is uh, something that takes a long time. They look at it more as a marathon. Uh, the missionaries obsess on the competition. They create a kind of aristocracy of the founders. They're not inclusive of the rest of the team. And uh, they're really driven by their financial statements, as opposed to their mission and value statements, for example, or obsessing on the customers. I won't read all of this slide to you, but I, I think it's the difference between an attitude of entitlement and an attitude of contribution. It was not very many years ago during the boom when a fortune reporter interviewed a graduate second year student, I think, at the Stanford Business School. And he said he felt uh, his career would be a failure if in three years he hadn't made $5 million on his startup. And uh, well over half the plan was writing the business plans for the, half the class was writing the business plans for their new ventures. I think writing the plans for the new ventures is fine, but uh, to be sure, if, you're, uh, if, if you wouldn't take on an opportunity or a mission, sorry, if the reason you're taking on a mission or an opportunity is for the money you'll make, I believe you'll fail. You should find your passion, find that mission, and take it on even if no one paid you anything for it, because then you and your team uh, will be motivated to succeed. Somebody uh, asked me the question, well, what satisfied you the most in your life? And I want to get to that in a second. But I do think the difference between a mercenary and a missionary is the difference between someone who's living the deferred life plan, i.e., I'll put off until the future having a full life, and the whole life plan, one that works. There's a difference between the lust for making money and, to be sure, the interest in making money, but really, at the final accounting, a lust for making meaning out of your work. So the question for all of you is why are you doing what you're doing? Why are you an entrepreneur? And a question that I like to add to that is how will the world be different as a result of you having been here on this planet? If you imagine yourself at 90 years old and you look back on your life, what's the impact that you wanted to have made? And I would bet you that as you think from that perspective, it's not going to be about having the best term sheet. It's not going to be about necessarily the IPO. There's going to be something bigger than that. There's going to be something more meaningful. And 
one of the last criteria that we look for is, are you in it just for the money? Or is something else going to motivate you? And the reason why is that it's not a philosophical reason. It's not because, you know, we're from California, we want to hug people. It's because this stuff is difficult, right? And you're going to need something to motivate you more than money. Because at a certain point, it's going to get tough. And if it's money, it's going to be really tempting to go to Wall Street, go to a firm, take something that's going to pay you well, because that's the thing that's driving you. But everyone here has something within them, has something that you've experienced as an individual, whether it's through your family, whether it's through your friends, a problem that really that you want to solve because it means something to your life. Find that specific thing. You heard me talk about that earlier. Find that thing and tap into that motivation. And that's the thing that's going to make you successful because ultimately, startups, entrepreneurship, it's about change. So you're going to go through change as a founder from the minute that you get into your startup. As you start thinking about that, you're going to develop. And hopefully, as your company becomes more successful, you're going to change the lives of your customers. You're going to make it better for them, right? And as a successful entrepreneur, especially from a region that may not have the entrepreneurship culture yet, you've got a chance to change a country. And if you can imagine changing a country, then it's not that difficult to think about a world that's very different, that's a result of everything that you're doing here today. So I thank all of you for being here, and thank you for the time.